Um, hello, everyone, for joining. Um, today, I'll talk about my work in the multidisciplinary design optimization lab in the aerospace engineering department. Um, and the main motivation for our work is to reduce the environmental impact of aviation. But currently, aviation is responsible for about 9% of the difficult to eliminate CO2 emissions. This is because while we have alternative energy sources to decarbonize many of the large industries, we do not have any emission-free alternatives for long-range air travel, and we still have to rely on fossil fuels. Um, this graph here shows the outlook on the emission sources from transportation in general. Um, the purple area on top represents the emissions from aviation. And while its absolute magnitude does not change much, its relative impact is going to increase as we decarbonize other industries. And this stresses the importance of developing sustainable alternatives for long range air travel. Um, this graph shows the size of the aviation industry in black and um, the emissions per passenger kilometer um, in red. The growth of the field has been balanced by the improvements in aircraft efficiency so far, but these improvements start to um, plateau in the recent years. And my research goal is to make significant improvements in the aircraft efficiency through two main approaches. So first, I work on developing computational tools that enable us to design better aircraft with the given technology. And secondly, I investigate novel aircraft concepts which have a potential to significantly increase aircraft efficiency. And to achieve these goals, we work on multidisciplinary design optimization or MDO in the MDO lab at the aerospace engineering department. We work on both fundamental method development for MDO and we also apply these methods um, for the optimization of aircraft, wind turbines, cars, satellites, and so on. Um, to give you an idea of the scale of the problems we work with, um, this example shows one of the larger optimization problems we've solved. It involves optimizing a 777 size aircraft while considering the coupled aerostructural design. We use computational fluid dynamics or CFD to model the aerodynamics, which is coupled to a finite element solver to model the structural response of the aircraft. And op an optimization of this size requires several days of runtime on hundreds of processors and the design variables, we often have like hundreds of them. Um, so in today's presentation, I'll talk about two of the main research areas I focused on during my PhD. Um, I will try to keep both of these at a high level because I think the audience has a lot of diversity in terms of field. And I hope some of the approaches we've been using will be interesting for the general public. So um, the first topic is on the development of robust nonlinear solvers for CFD applications. Um, so robustness of the entire design optimization framework is essential for using design optimization as a push button solution. So let's say we want to optimize an airfoil to generate lift in certain flight conditions. And we, can, we, we could start from a design that already looks like an airfoil and the optimizer can improve this design by making small adjustments. However, in that example, we already start from a good design. But what if we have no design intuition? Um, and for example, in the figure here in the bottom left, let's say we start from a circle instead of an airfoil. To start from this initial design and still converge to the optimal airfoil shape, the optimization algorithm goes through intermediate designs as you can see in the middle below. So to get this push button solution where we start with zero design intuition, the optimization framework needs to be able to handle these extreme cases. One of the weak links in this chain is the CFD solver and where these solvers can fail with challenging cases that have blunt features like we see here. To address this robustness issue, I worked on an approximate Newton Krylov or an ANK solver in our open source CFD code AD flow. Now I'll just do a high level overview of the solver itself. And um, for the ANK solver, we start with the Newton's method to solve a system of nonlinear equations. Here Q represents the states and R represents the residuals of the governing equations. So in this context, we want to converge the residuals to zero to obtain a steady state solution. To do this, we use the Newton's method where the update to the state delta Q is formulated using this equation. This is a linear system and partial R partial Q term that appears on the left-hand side 
is what's called the Jacobian. To obtain the update to the states, we need to solve this linear system and we use a Krylov subspace method for this. And as a result, this type of solar algorithm is called Newton-Krylov. Um, so the baseline Newton's method works really well near the final solution. However, when we're away from the solution, the method might not converge at all. The video on the right shows the convergence of a simple wing in transonic condition, which results in multiple shock waves on the upper surface of the wing. The transients caused by these shock waves cause Newton's solvers to struggle, and we need better startup methods to handle these transients. To address this issue, um, we add a time stepping term on the left hand side. So at small time steps, this gives us a standard backward Euler method. And at large time steps, the time stepping term drops out and we recover the Newton's method. This approach is called pseudo transient continuation. And we use this method to stabilize the transients in our solution during the initial stages. And finally, the special sauce in our solver is the use of approximate residual routines. So the figures below represent the computational stencil required to compute the residual in the center cell. R0 is the stencil we would need for a second order accurate finite volume scheme on structured grids. And we always use the stencil for the right hand side residuals. However, for the Jacobian itself, we can use any of the approximate formulations below. So here we introduce two approximate levels. R2 is similar to a low order accurate discretization. So it becomes first order in this case. And R1 is somewhere in between first and second order accurate. We suggest that by using these approximate routines that use a smaller stencil, the linear sy system we solve at each Newton step will be easier to solve at the cost of less accurate nonlinear updates. And the final trade-off here is not obvious without some numerical experiments. So in this example, um, we use the three levels of the residue routines for the same aircraft configuration. And for all cases, we switch to a fully coupled Newton's method in the thermal part of convergence. And the approximate Newton solver is only active during the initial stages. The figure on the left shows nonlinear convergence with respect to nonlinear iterations. And as expected, um, the most accurate Jacobian formulation, that's the one with the R0 case, converges with the least number of iterations. And as we introduce approximations to the Jacobian, convergence per nonlinear iterations reduced, so we end up needing more nonlinear iterations. However, the figure on the right shows the convergence of the same three cases with respect to wall time. So in this case, the approx approximate R1 and R2 cases actually end up converging faster than the more, accurate, more accurate Jacobian. And this is due to two effects. First, um, the approximate routines themselves include fewer terms to compute, so each linear iteration ends up being faster. And secondly, because the linear systems are more diagonally dominant with the approximate Jacobians, they are easier to solve. As a result of these two effects, the approximate variance ended up converging faster than the full Jacobian. Um, but remember our original goal was robustness. So what can we say about that? To test the robustness of the solver, we simulated a wing body configuration at 90 degrees angle of attack. Um, so in this case, the airflow, the airflow is coming from the bottom. This is not a physical case. It's almost like an aircraft falling really fast. Um, but what we wanted to do here is to get, a, get the most extremely challenging case that we could. Most steady state CFD solvers struggle with these cases with separation and with this example, we show that we can pretty much converge anything that comes up during optimization. This is not a physical test case, right? The assumptions that went into our steady state range formulations went out of the window way before we got to this point, but it just shows the numerical robustness of the solver itself. Um, so that was it for the ANK solver. And now I'll talk a bit about my work on aeropropulsive design optimization. This work is motivated by a technology called boundary layer ingestion, or BLI, which is a coupled air propulsive concept. The top figure here is a simplified example of a traditional propulsion system. So you have an airframe that generates drag and generates a boundary layer, 
which is just slow moving air, you can think of it that way. And you also have a propulsor that's located away from the airframe. For steady flight, the thrust from the propulsor is equal to the drag from the airframe and the net force on the entire body ends up being zero. However, with this approach, we're wasting quite a bit of energy. So if you look at the weight profile that you can see here, um, you can see that there are parts of fast and slow moving air. And you can think of these non-uniformities in the weight as the energy we're losing in the weight. And our goal with using BLI is to avoid wasting energy in the wake of the aircraft, basically. So the bottom figure here shows how this configuration would look like with BLI. And in, in this case, the propulsion system is integrated to the airframe. It ingests the boundary layer of the airframe. And with this approach, the net force on the whole body is still zero for a steady flight. But now the velocity profile on the wake of the aircraft is more uniform because we're losing less energy in the wake with BLI the aircraft can sustain steady flight with a lower power, which is equivalent to a more efficient flight. And BLI is not just a theory on paper. So this is the um, D8 concept from MIT. And it was experimentally shown that the BLI configuration used about 8% less power compared to a traditional potted configuration. Now, this aircraft, looks very different compared to the traditional ones that we see at the airports. And it's because there's, there are many more technologies here than just BLI, uh, but we do not need to have this big of a change in design in our aircraft to utilize boundary layer ingestion. So that's why um, we've been focusing on the Stark ABL concept developed by NASA. As you can see, it is very similar to a conventional aircraft that you would see in the airports today, except for the fan on the rear fuselage. The Stark ABL concept uses this fan to ingest the boundary layer generated by the fuselage to obtain better air propulsive performance. And to explain how the BLI system works here, this configuration has two traditional turbofan engines on the wings. And besides providing thrust, these engines also generate electricity, and we use this electricity to drive the electric BLI fan that's located on the aft fuselage. Even though this configuration is very similar to conventional aircraft, we still do not know how to design this coupled turboelectric propulsion system. To address this challenge, um, we performed aeropropulsive design optimizations of this configuration, where we focused on the aft propulsor and tried to estimate how much benefit we were getting from using BLI. But this work was funded by the NASA T-Cube and AATT projects. So to estimate the benefit of BLI, we compare a BLI configuration to a reference pod configuration. Um, using the power requirements from these two configurations, we can define a metric called power saving coefficient or PSC, which is similar to a relative efficiency gain from BLI. You can think of it that way. For the Stark ABL concept, we also looked at a BLI and a reference power configuration. Um, the BLI configuration uses the propulsor near the aft fuselage and just the fuselage boundary layer, as I showed before, while the reference powder case ingests free stream air. And in the figures here, you can see the symmetry plane of the three dimensional CFD domain we use in these optimizations. And the black rectangles here represent the areas where we model the effect of a fan using body force terms. Um, so in this work, we focus on the aft propulsor design, as I mentioned, and uh, this is because modeling the entire propulsion system of a configuration this size is extremely challenging. To sidestep this challenge, we just optimize the design of the BLI fan and we perform a parameter sweep with important design parameters. So in this context, we kind of devi deviated um, from the push button solution I introduced earlier, right? And we're now using design optimization as a tool we can practically incorporate in the existing design approaches. So this table on the right shows the optimization problem formulation. We have an objective function, design variables and constraints. And now I'll introduce um, the meaning of each term here. So the objective function here represents the performance of the design and we want the best possible value here. For example, no matter how I divide up my design problem, if I'm looking at the aft propulsor only or the whole system, 
I will always want to minimize the power consumption. The design variables here represent the control we have over the detailed design of the aircraft. Um, even though they're important parameters, I myself actually do not care what they are as long as they give me the best design. Um, and this is why I'm having the optimizer adjust these variables instead of worrying about them myself. Now, I have two sets of constraints in this problem. The first two entries you see represent the high level design parameters I want to work with. The values with a star superscript represent the target values in my parameter sweep. And I want to solve my optimization problem under these constraints. I picked these two values because they're important design parameters. The CFX term you see ends up determining how much of the thrust I'm getting from the aft propulsor. And the fan pressure ratio or FPR is just an important parameter for any propulsion system. These values implicitly depend on my detailed design variables. And this is why they appear as constraints here. If these were explicit parameters, I would not I would just directly set them. But in this case, I cannot. And I must have the optimizer drive these values to the target values I want. And finally, I have the last two entries here, which is what I need to get a realistic design. So for this case, a lift coefficient target ensures that the aircraft is operating at cruise conditions. And the geometric thickness constraints are there to avoid obtaining a very thin structure here in the cell. If I wanted to get a push button design, then I would need to include many more constraints here to ensure the safety of the configuration. However, you can imagine this gets out of hand pretty quickly in aircraft design since there's so many safety critical cases to consider. So instead, I use a minimal set of constraints to ensure I have a realistic design. And by varying the important high level design parameters myself, I can perform a parameter sweep to see how the power requirement would change as I move in the design space. So in this context, using design optimization actually gives me the best possible design. And instead, if I were to do a simple parameter sweep without optimization, the trends could be off because the design I used was suboptimal. And also for this case, because of the two values I'm interested in are defined implicitly, I would not even be able to um, match the values perfectly myself if I varied the design variables by hand. So using this approach, um, we optimize the design of both BLI and product configurations at a, config at a combination of um, three fan size and three fan pressure ratio values. So this results in nine optimizations for each configuration and in total, we performed 18 CFD-based aeropropulsive design optimizations. The plot on the left shows us the power requirements of each optimized design. And using these results, we computed the power saving coefficient values at nine design points. And the plot on the left showed the trends we obtained in the end. So this sounds like an awful lot of work to obtain three lines, but for this particular problem, Several low fidelity design studies estimated that the PSC value would increase with increasing fan pressure ratio. But in our results, uh, we show that the PSC values actually decrease as we increase fan pressure ratio. Um, this is a single study, so we cannot draw any strong conclusions from this. However, the discrepancies between the high and low fidelity design studies emphasize the importance of using CFD based design optimization. So, to wrap things up, I've introduced some of the fundamental method development for MDO and also talked about an application of these methods. In the end, these optimization approaches may be our only chance of designing complex aircraft like the Stark ABL concept. And finally, I think computation researchers in other fields can benefit from some of the methods that we've been developing because optimization itself is such a powerful, powerful tool. So thank you for listening. Um, feel free to contact me for um, any questions about this work. And you can find some of the open source tools I use in this work here. And I'd like to also thank everyone in the MDO lab for providing me with these resources. So thank you.